Uh, thank you very much for this invitation. Sorry to disturb your free day. <laughs> but it's nice to be here. I think uh, that the European Union is at the moment more important than ever, despite we are in a real stress situation. If you look into the world, then I think no European nation is able uh, to deal with the consequences of uh, the social and economic consequences of globalization. It's a question of external securities, where especially Ukraine is a case because Russia broke international law with East Ukraine and Crimea. The question of migration, terror, climate change, uh, the situation in Africa and what it means for migration and internal security, and many other questions. And uh, that uh, this European Union has to be therefore much stronger in answering that because uh, no nation state can do that anymore alone. If the Europeans do not unite, then there will not be a player in the future. Because of the policy of President Trump, you are in a special pre uh, pressure. If the Europeans do not unite, the world will be divided between Beijing and Washington, and partly as a third power into that Russia. But Russia only in a military sense, not in an economic sense. Therefore, the pressure to answer these challenges for the European Union is bigger than ever. And there will be a lot of reform programs. You can read it with the speeches by President Macron but the discussions which happened today in Sofia between the 28 leaders of the European Union uh, to conduct the future process of unification. Ukraine plays a certain role in that too. First of all, the European Union is based on values. This values means individual freedom, the value of the person, and when it comes to nation, that a nation can develop in that way. And if you have the pressure of a foreign uh, country, that you have to follow certain lines, then this is a violation of that. What Russia did in 2014 is to destroy two principles of international law, which are in general very old. They were conducted in my home region in 1648 with the Westphalian peace. But they were now brought back into international law in a real sense by the Helsinki Agreement and later on in the Budapest Memorandum towards Ukraine and so on. It means the territory integrity of a country and it means the sovereignty of a country. These two principles were violated by Russia. And if we let them do that, then it's also against the European interest, because then wars might be possible again in all of Europe. Russia has argued for given the reason why they have done that and doing that, they said. My minorities, Russian minorities, are discriminated. We know that is not true. But even it would be true. It's not reason for a war. It's reason to go, Russia is member there, to the European Court of Human Rights, of the Council of Europe. They've said I have historical rights to the Crimea, for example. If you would do that and accept such an argument, I know a hundred places in Europe where you might have such historical rights. And the third one is, I feel that my security is not interest, security interests are not met totally. All three of these points together, or one of these points, gives you a reason for war. 
And this would be a violation of about the two principles I have mentioned. And in order to keep these principles, we are obliged to support Ukraine because of our own interests. If we would accept that Russian policy towards Ukraine, we would accept this policy of Russia against Poland, Baltic states, and so on. And therefore, uh, we stick to Ukraine uh, because this is the place where at the moment has to be decided whether these principles of international law still exist and have an importance. The further on is, look, that is again, I argue from our own interest, which is perhaps the most credible way why we support the Ukraine. We had a German Prussian strategist in the 19th century, Clausewitz. He wrote a book about, it's a little bit Prussian Machiavelli. And he wrote, Support the neighbor of your possible enemy. Therefore, I would feel as a German safer if between me and Russia is an independent, successful Ukraine. Makes us all feel better in Europe. That is a very defensive, defensive point. But this is, I think, also an argument. And the third one is why we have to support that is what we have done with our partner association agreement, a free uh, trade agreement, is to make the Ukraine a successful democratic state under the rule of law and help him. I believe, and I was in Maidan 2 and Maidan might done one quite often, that what Putin mostly is afraid of is that this Ukraine becomes a economic and social successful countries where personal freedom and democracy, democracy and the rule of law play an important role. If this such an Ukraine would be successful, he has no argument anymore to his own people why they need a Putin system. I'm convinced and uh, I know Mr. Putin himself a little bit that as he looked into the eyes on the TV of the young people on the Maidan, he saw in these young faces, young Russian faces in Moscow. And all the strategic arguments of what you have given before, I think in his importance is not so, in his opinion, are not so important. He's afraid of such a movement might get success. I mean, it has also economic success. And the level of standard of living increases, then he's in a disaster. Russia has not made any economic progress in the last 25 years. They still rely on export of raw materials, especially energy. There is no self-relying economy, as for example China has achieved it. If you go 100 kilometers out of Moscow, the standard of living is the same as in the Brezhnev time. You have these big companies, but not medium-sized companies you need. And if that would be changed here, then it would be, for him, difficult to explain that. Look, we had a certain situation after 1989 in many European countries who are now members of the European Union. And uh, give the example of Poland. The GDP, 
GDP of Poland and Ukraine when 1990 more or less the same. Now the Polish uh, GNP is nearly five times higher than 1990 because of the internal development, its economic development, the openness of the European market, membership of the European Union. And Vitaly Klitschko has told me once, some years ago, as he went from Kiev regularly by car to Hamburg because of his boxing, he went through a grey Poland, through a grey GDR, to come to West Germany. Now he is going through a grey Ukraine, he says, but it's not so the case anymore because he is progress, but a flourishing Poland, a GDR which has got the standard smallness of West Germany, and he would like that his children would go to Ukraine from Kiev to the borders which had the same level. That is his dream, he said. And if that would be happen, happening, then Moscow has lost. And this we want to support. This free trade agreement is already working. <coughs> There's much more export from the Ukraine now to international market and to the European market. But there are still problems. We need more, you need more investments in your country, which is potentially a rich country. But so long you have war in your country, people are nervous to put their money in this country. That is the reason for the war. I do not believe the reason for the war in East Ukraine is to get it. It's very expensive for Russia. But if you have a war in a country, it's difficult to get a transformation process. And here the country itself has to do something. And therefore, we have combined with our aid a certain pro uh, uh, development in this country which is important. Therefore, the rule of law is not a question of human rights, of the rights of the individual that when he goes to court, he gets his rights. But it's also a question of economic importance. You get only foreign investments if the investor has the feeling that he has a free treatment, uh, treatment before a court. So, rule of law is a condition for investments. And uh, therefore, we are putting such priorities on that. Including that is the question of corruption. Here we are at a moment not satisfied about the development. There's done an incredible lot of laws and better situation and reforms since 2014. But here we have the feeling at the moment that it's a blockage. It's decided mostly in first reading, then it's gone. Hundreds, thousands of amendments, and the Verkhoeknorade does not decide. The instruments block each other. The oligarchs are still there and can control the economy of the country, especially in their regions. And uh, this is also not helpful to get the creati creativity in the economy of your country, but as well get investments from the outside if they see that because such a system you have to be bribed, they have to bribe others, or they are in a situation of uncertainty. And uh, therefore I think it's this question of uh, a corruption court, the clarification between the general prosecutor and the anti-corruption office and all that of the utmost importance. And we in the European Parliament, we have decided yesterday, it's not totally out that we believe that the new macrofinancial aid you need, we should give only if a certain progress in legislation will happen in the next weeks. So you see here the interest of both sides. Needs Ukraine, EU or EU, Ukraine. I must tell you also that the European Union has put on the table since 2014 around 13 billion euros, which is not seen in this country, but it's so, and we are ready to do more. 
And in order to get this positive development forward and a little bit faster forward. And I believe also that this is needed that the younger people in this country become not dissatisfied with the democratic system and uh, the country will not fall back into a disarray again because there's not satisfaction that the reforms go fast enough. Uh, at least I have a feeling that in parts of the society, especially with younger people, this is a discussion point, which we should be aware of it. And uh, as you just have now read the latest opinion polls for the presidential election of the party, that nobody is higher than 14%, then I do not see really who is running the country in future and where is the trust, the broad amount to any political person or party. And uh, this makes me feel me a little bit unsure. In the future, maybe some of them will run the country. I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. My second question, before we start the series of questions from the uh, students, Russian propaganda says that European Union can be a project will be f which will fail because European Union is not based on values. European Union doesn't respect family. European Union does not respect Christianity anymore. And uh, that European Union is reduced to only bureaucratic procedures. And for this reason, Putin claims that only Russia is a protector of true Christian and family values. What can you answer to this? Look, I believe what I said in the beginning, if to the values belongs to my Christian understanding of values, if I look into the Catholic social teaching, where you have the right relationship between the rights of the indiv individual, the individual person, personality, is something which is part of Christian teaching. But a person who is, feels also responsibility for the community. This both together is my understanding from, from a state or should be organized. And I do not see that in Russia. The evil person has no right. There's no opposition possible. There's no media freedom. Uh, you cannot change government there. That has nothing to do with Christianity. It has nothing to do with the rights of the individual person to develop himself. And uh, therefore, that Russia claims to be the shepherd of Christian values is a joke. When uh, one and a half weeks ago, uh, the weekend before his inauguration, just because of a peaceful uh, demonstration, a thousand people would be put into prison as it happened then you sh uh, cannot call it that it's a shepherd of Christianity. I believe also that Russia is not successful. Look, the European Union is one of the most economic and social and uh, developed uh, entities of this world. This failure, European Union as it's called, has 25% of the trade of this world. Our part of the tr of, uh, trade in the world is nearly so big as Russia and China together. Uh, uh, United States and China together. The European Union has around 20-25% of the GMP of this world. The citizens of the European Union get around 50% of all social state social benefits of this world. The 7.3% of world population get 50% of all state social aid of this world. Health system, pensions and so on. And you cannot call that a failed state. We have created in the last 25 years the most successful integrated internal market of the world, which is more integrated than the American one. We have created from nothing a monetary union, 
But this currency is at the moment the second most successful one. No, in the last figures of the last two years, the most successful currency of the world. Then uh, you see the development of the relationship of dollar and, and the euro. We have problems there. There's partly not still enough developed, and some security is missing. Therefore, we have here in a big, big reform process the part, the speech by President Macron, the Sorbonne is perhaps an example for that, and the leaders of the European Union debated again this morning in Sofia, where we go forward. This failed European Union had last year a higher growth rate than the United States of America. We got the last year's 10 million more jobs in the European Union. So I c despite all the problems, shortcomings, failures, lack of answers to challenges in the world, you cannot call it a failed thing. And when you talk about this is against Christian values because of the gays, then we have to discuss what values are. To be gay is not supported, but people are gay. And what I believe is, I'm a Catholic, I'm a convinced Catholic. But I do not believe that you should organize a state where you have to live as a Catholic. I would like to live in a state where I have no problems to live as a Catholic. But I would hate a state where I'm forced to live as a Catholic. Uh, as a Catholic. There must be pluralism. So long someone does not violate the, right, the rights of his neighbors, he should have some freedom, tolerance, pluralism. That is my understanding of a modern state. But destroy that because these misunderstandings to get an authoritarian regime, that is not a solution for me. And uh, Therefore, also, I think, uh, and it's not so that uh, every second person is, lives in a gay marriage in Europe or in Germany. This is just overdoing that. And I'm sure you have gays in Ukraine and you have gays in Russia. And it's a way uh, that how you to deal with that. And uh, I believe that this question of tolerance should be there, that someone has is born in that way. It's, it was my own church said it for, in the past, it's an illness. It's not an illness. That's old thinking. Uh, but uh, to pressure people because they have this way of sexual life, I think that should be not part of a modern free society. Uh, but we have to protect others. I believe personally that Gays should not be discriminated, but I would be against the debate against the gay marriage. But this debate we have all in all European countries. And uh, this is part of tolerance and debate and majority. My own party is against it, but other parties are for it. And uh, therefore, I cannot see that this European Union is not secure, is not living in the tolerances of Christianity, and if you see the Treaty of Lisbon, which is the Treaty of the European Union, and see there, perhaps it could be possible to perhaps give this audience it in the future, the, uh, the values of the European Union, which is written down in a paper which belongs to the Treaty of Lisbon, which starts with that sense that the the rights of the individual and the intermissible cannot be violated, where the family is mentioned in a way to protect it. Uh, where it's protected, for example, the human value against certain technological developments. And uh, I think that it's very modern, that it's part of the constitution of the European Union. And there you cannot say that it's not value-based. Okay, <clears throat> now we will 
start the tour of questions from the audience, and afterwards I will ask my final question. Please, who has question? You can rise. So the nuclear and the nuclear bomb comes at the end. No, no, no. no. <laughs> Preserve their values. Where do you think this uh, danger comes most from? Uh, is it the uh, immigrants that are flourishing, or, or uh, do they bring their uh, own values to the table instead of the European ones? Thank you. First of all, that in this global order, every European nation alone is too small to answer the challenge globalization, legalization, terrorism, and so on. These are all international threats and challenges. And only together we have the critical mass to give an answer to that. I never tell you migration. Migration can only brought under control what we try to do now and we have a joint outside border control. and no borders between the member states of the European Union. And this is developed at the moment. When it comes to migration, we have to look into the causes, root causes of it. You have around 12 and a half million refugees within Syria and around Syria. Here, you have to give human, protect people that they can survive. And Europe has not done the most. The most has done Turkey. In Turkey lives since four years, three and a half million Syrian refugees. What we have done, we have made a contract with Lebanon where we have four million inhabitants in Lebanon, but 1.7 million refugees. Jordan is similar. That the European Union United supports now the refugees in these countries. We give money not to the Turkish government, but to international organizations and directly to cities to look after housing, medical service, school teaching, and so on. If we have a whole generation of refugees which have never seen a school, then we have created new numbers of terrorism, terrorists. It's successful. And since then we have done that deal in 2016, jointly. We have, in the last year, 90% less migrants from the Middle East than 2015. In this cooperation. We have decreased also the number from Africa. But it's more difficult. Look, Africa's population will be doubled in the next 25 years. If you see climate change, if you see unfair economic practices, trade agreements, if you see dictators who take money out of their countries and bring it to Panama and such wonderful places, if you see that there are terrorist groups and tribal groups to fight each other, then you have less and less standards of living and more and more people leave their, these countries and go to Europe. You can do what you want. No, outside, uh, by, uh, no fences, no walls can keep them out. That is historical experience. 1,000 years, 1,700 years ago, the Germanic tribes went from the east and the north of these continents. They were nearly in this direction living. And destroyed the biggest power of the time, the Roman Empire. Were not stopped by the biggest wall in, until that moment, the Lemus, and founded uh, an empire for 100 years in, in northern Africa, which was the corn chamber for Europe, because that Tunisia and so on was very fertile land. 
And they left the east and the north of Europe because of climate change. Nobody could stop them. It became too cold here. Now we have the other way around. And this we have to take into account. We have now the better situation because we can see the development, we know the climate development, we know what with the Sahel zone happens, so that we can prepare to prevent such a development in the other direction. And that we can do only together. If it would be do the Netherlands or Ukraine or Germany alone, it has no importance. If we can do it together, we can manage it. We can cooperate with the Northern African countries, what we do now, so far it's possible with them. We go with troops of Germany and France and others to Niger and other countries to control, uh, 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 to control uh, their terrorism. We put camps there and educate people with qualifications they can go back to their countries to help them. So far it's still possible in their developments. So we have this combination of security and development in order to get better standards and less migration. That is done at the moment, step by step, too late, but it's done, and this has to develop that. That is our migration policy. If you stop the European Union, we will all overwhelmed by migration because of the reasons I've given before. I would like to return to values. Um, recently, we had opportunity to read Paris Declaration, which was signed by European intellectuals they claim that something goes wrong in the European Union. And we can see the crisis, financial and economic crisis of Greece several years ago. We see populist and nationalist movements that rise in Poland, in Hungary. We have Brexit. Something is going in other ways that it was planned by father, founder of the European Union. What will be the future of the European Union in order to not face such challenges as we are facing now? Look, that is not just a European question. That is a question you face in, uh, face in, um, uh, in individual countries. It's nothing, uh, not only to do with European policy. You have the same development in the United States. Le Pen in France, Brexit, AfD in Germany and Trump were supported by the same groups of society. Unqualified workforce, certain parts of uh, small and medium sized companies owners and the older people who believe in national greatness. The motive for unqualified workforce is and for the this medium-sized people, middle-class people, is the uncertainty about the international development. They see that in globalization, where is my place? They see that digitization changes whole value chains. A simple example. A shoe shop closing because your generation is buying with Amazons. It's a practical result. It changes things in the economy. That things also changes in certainties for my job, for my social future. And here people are afraid of. But to go to the national level means absolutely no chance to fight that. We have to explain that only together Europe can become so strong. To fight that and get our rights and have our market shares in this question. Therefore we develop more di uh, digital internal market, which is quite complicated by the change of rules, binding rules. But the Amazons and Googles otherwise will run this world. They will not pay taxes in Europe. They do not pay taxes in this country. And we want to make it clear that where the value is created, there must also be paid taxes for the society, for education, 
and so on. This we try now together. So we want to create the answer to that in order to show that Europe is the only place to provide security, also in a social and economic field. External field, we can debate it later too. And uh, that I think it's an important point. We have to show that the nationalist way is the way of the past, which will bring us less competitiveness, less jobs, and to dream that this technology development in the world can be stopped in a romantic way is totally wrong. Never in man's history uh, technology development was stopped. I do not know any example. It might be delayed, and if you delay it artificially in your own region and country and do not support it, you have even less jobs at the end. Even if populists say that this is a, such a wonderful thing to, st to stop it. You have to create the conditions that the freedom of the individual is secured and the social future is secured, but not to stop it. This we can also in this environment only if we create a critical mass for a European market which c it can become competitive with the Chinese and the Americans. Simple as that. That's what we try. But we were not able to make that sure. In the old nationalist way, the European Union was founded, starting with coal and steel in six countries, of the experience of the last two year, uh, big year, uh, wars in Europe. This part of Europe was the victim of these two wars, especially of the Second World War but others even more in the First World War. And this part of the World War was sent around. And the eastern borders of Poland are the borders of the Hitler-Stalin Pact. These two wars cost together 70, 80 million people's life. And we have said, the leaders of the European Union, the Adenauers and the Gaspris who founded it, have said, never dictatorship anymore, never war again. And we have achieved that. 70 years freedom. I think it was a big way of civilization. That is from the six countries, we have to make it now to the 27, 28 countries. Which it works, not perfect, but it works until now. And this is the great story. We are rich. We give support for the weaker parts. Do you know, for example, that the European Union spends every year 50 billion euros for the weaker countries and regions in Europe to make them more prosper? 50 billion euros per year. And uh, this has led us that we have a situation in Portugal or Greece which is not comparable. You should look at the pictures of 1980 and the pictures of nowadays. And we were able also to stop this development with the financial crisis to coming from the United States in 2008. No country went bankrupt. Not one. We stopped that by our means. It was a big debate also in my own country because we had to take risks in that. But we have this increase of growth a country like Ireland which was bankrupt in 2008 because the banks went bankrupt because of this financial crisis has today 5.5 billion growth rate, uh, uh, percent growth rate. All the countries have growth rate, even Greece has now growth rates. So it's not perfect because our instruments are still in developing. That's the reason what we discuss. But nobody went bankrupt and is now on a better side to develop. One more, the other less, it depends on that creativ creativity and courage to make these internal reforms. So that is also a success story, with a lot of pains reached. And uh, when you use come to these nationalist ideas, 
what we see now, but Trump says America first. The joint front of the West is in danger. Therefore, NATO is in danger. I was four weeks ago in Japan and Korea, also in the demilitarized zone in Korea. They are very much afraid that there might be a deal between the Americans and the Chinese because of economic reasons. Uh, if we see that these two wars in Europe and the wars many uh, hundreds of years before of the nation state were always the disaster of Europe. The former French president Mitterrand has once said in the European Parliament, nationalism means war. And we are in a situation that is values, Christian values. The European nations are built on more or less on the same values. And this has four sources. Three are hills, Golgotha, Acropolis, and Capitola. The Christian thinking, religious. The Greek philosophy, and the Roman legal thinking, plus enlightenment. This you have in countries in a different level and balance, but they are in all European countries. And therefore, the Spanish philosopher Ortega y Gasset has once said, four-fifths of the culture of European nations are the same. One-fifth is different. In the past, we were told by our leaders, this one-fifth which differs us gives me the moral right to be higher than the others. This led them to nationalism and say, I have a right to conquer another country because I'm morally higher, because I have higher values. That was all the disaster. And now what we're going to get with the Erasmus generation, the European Union, that we did not, do not consider the differences as an advantage of myself, nationalist advantage, but a belief that everyone has the same four-fifths and the others are common richdom. This does not divide us, that it completes it. It's the milk on the cappuccino. And young people do that. They travel in Europe and do not understand anymore why the French boy or the Italian girl is less valuable than myself. This is the idea behind Europe. Declared as comrade, but please also never change that. Make it not a united Europe in that way that everything is the same. We have put on the European Constitution proposal that time that is over in Europe, unity in diversity. Keep the differences. Because if you do not keep the difference, we destroy the richdom. So keep national identity with its cultural differences, religious where rich is part of. But at the same time, see that it's not so big a difference that it means to go, you have to create war against each other. That's the philosophy of European unification thinking. And here we have to go forward and fight these populist, nationalist attitudes. Uh -huh. Please. Uh, Mr. Brock, the uh, European Union uh, uh, works now on the basis of this country. Do you think it should be changed or not? If yes, why this country works not good or it's not good? So what, what do you think about it? The Lisbon Treaty is an incredible progress. But as everything was, mankind is created, not perfect. We have still too many places where you need, we have a veto principle. And makes it difficult to go forward, especially in foreign policy. But every treaty in the European Union, I must myself, the parliamentary representative in the negotiations of many of them since the 90s, is 
to find a historical moment where the agreement between the 28 countries nowadays. The national constitution, mostly in most countries, you can decide by two third majority or something like that. The European Union, all countries have to ratify it. If one not, it does not exist. That makes it difficult. But it's in progress that we are now in 99.5% of legislation, we have majority vote. Therefore, we have created an internal market and a monetary union. Uh, but we have it not in taxation and in foreign policy, mostly. And this, at the moment, challenges that I spoke about, by, for example, over the Googles, but in foreign policy, that's the point. Look, the European Union and its member states give 60% of the development aid of this world. 70% of the humanitarian aid for the Middle East, the war country, is paid by the European Union and its member states. But because we need too long to step up to become a foreign policy and a defense policy factor, we did not sit in the table of decision making when the big powers talk, despite we are the richest. And that is, creates a problem for our security. And here we have to go forward and do more. What, for example, was successful in the very beginning, the 23 states of the European Union founded in December the Defense Union, where we start now for procurement, research for that, and so on. If we do that together, we could save every year 100 billion euros. The European Union member states spent double so much money for defense in Russia. We have more soldiers in the United States, but the result is ridiculous because of the lack of cooperation in these fields. And here we have started now a new dimension to go forward with that. And uh, we have to see in opinion polls that 70, 80 percent of the European people support us in that. And uh, it means also to go back on the, on the globe. Otherwise, we will not exist. And this has also an impact on Ukraine, the balance of power in Europe, whether you're members of the European Union are or not. And uh, therefore, I think this is an important step forward. Uh, but that is always in public debate. Is the half glass emptier or half full? I believe it's half full. But if you not move fast now because of the changing situation, then we might at the end of it as the losers. But if we fall apart, we are anyway the losers. Okay, there was a hand I saw. Yeah, please. So uh, my question will be about uh, uh, stories of success. And uh, Polish story um, um, was realized uh, with help of uh, Europe and uh, some, so, uh, some uh, financial uh, help. And uh, in Ukraine, now we have a situation uh, that we have uh, many uh, external debts, and uh, in the next several years, we will have many payouts uh, by these debts. And also, uh, maybe we'll have a really populist government, so we will have some uh, economical and political stagnation. So, <clears throat> also, uh, there is a question in Europe about a Martian, Marshall Plan uh, uh, for Ukraine. And my question is, uh, can this Marshall Plan uh, be a, um, story, a success, successive story for Ukraine? And uh, is it only uh, some uh, discussions about this in Europe? or uh, it is something uh, real that we can have in next uh, three, four, or five years, or maybe now. Thank you. I think the European Union is paying since some years out of this matter plan. It's not called so. I talked about the 13 billion euros. I talk about that, what we discuss at the moment, the new loans in that uh, macroeconomic assistance, which we have given several times, that you can pay your debts in the international uh, field. Uh, that is happening. But I said in a short version, again, what I said in the very beginning in a broader sense. 
you can pour so much money as you want if it goes to a wrong structure. So you have to reform, to transform the country, politically and economically so, that this money can create further values. Therefore we say, please continue with the transformation process. Now I come back again, for example, on this corruption question, the rule of law. I think a lot of things were done here in this country. And I think also what comes now into power, the regionalization question. It's an important good law here, where you can get more creativity from regions and towns and not are centralized in Kiev. And uh, this is all important steps forward. Uh, but the transformation process in that way is most important. I note myself, after German unification 1990, which was a condition to build up the GDR, the, we say, the five new lender, the former GDR, which had a similar state, uh, starting point than you. But for, uh, for sure that in better situation, you do not have a West Germany as they had. But the Poles did the same. The Baltic states are very successful. They are successful members of the Euro now. And uh, so do the internal reforms, then the money will be, have more value. Because if you take loans, then you must have a structure that these loans do not become a burden, but you earn something with these loans that you can pay it back and have even more for yourself and increase your standard of living. And therefore, this discussion only get a help. Sometimes we have in Greece and Italy the same debate. It's not helpful because put resources on wrong structures does not help in increases sovereign debt. And uh, therefore always this transformation process in a political and economic way in the social field is of the utmost importance to come to a successful development. And I will tell you also one thing from the history when you talk about the Marshall Plan, what is one of the reasons of the German success story after the war. All the Western European countries got a Marshall Fund. Most of them consumed it and then money was gone. We made it from the very beginning as a revolving fund. The people got the money to have to pay it back with very low interest rates. And if you see now the German KfW, which is the state bank which gives credits and so on internationally now. It's still based on that also Marshall Fund money because we never spent it. And so it's revolving. We still work in Germany with part of the old Marshall Fund money. We did not consume it. We used it. And this, I think, is also way. If you get something for free, and you spend it and then it's gone. And then it goes wrong, mostly also in wrong channels. And then we are again in the question of corruption. When you get public money, and it does not go to that way to, get, to become more competitiveness. And some are rich people are winners of that. Then it does not help the country. Therefore, the fight of the anti-corruption, not because of the other reasons I've given, is of the utmost importance to make a proper use of such money. Okay, thank you. There are still two questions. This will be the last two questions. Please. Uh, well, uh, can you compare the situation in Ukraine uh, if, if during the last uh, 20, 25 years uh, with the situation uh, of post-war in the post-war uh, uh, Germany? I mean, the, gra the, the cat economical and political catastrophe of Germany after the a defeat in the First World War, yes? And uh, then, uh, well, do not treat it as a, as a provocative question, but if you uh, read that book... I'm too old to be provoked. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if you read the, 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 the description of the situation in, the, in Germany, 
in the book of uh, Mein Kampf and compare with the situation in Ukraine, it's the one-to-one, one-to-one -one. One -one situation. Uh, I, 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 do not, I don't want to, 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 to mention about uh, that uh, uh, the question about Jews, and so I, I, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in the economical situation and the power which could <coughs> cure which could cure the economical and bribery and uh, so uh, corruption. Look, uh, we had very soon after the Second World War the rule of law with the help of the Americans and the British. But as we had set up the state in 49, this was mostly already done. But also the basis for the economic development. The father of our economic success after the war, Ludwig Erhard, the political inventor of social oriented market economy. I mean after, this first first uh, after the First World War. After the Second World War. No, no I mean after the First World War. Ah. That's a totally different story. That has nothing to do with that has nothing to do with Mein Kampf and that stories. This question was: We have to see that these treaties after the First World War were one some reasons of the disasters for Germany and others. There was put so much uh, uh, liabilities on us. It cost us at that time an incredible number of bankers, 250 billion gold mark we had to pay after the Second World War, uh, First World War, which brought us a big inflation and all that. Some territory was taken away, even more from Hungary. Hungary was, got, lost two-thirds of its soil. And uh, therefore, this, the winners, really slaughtered the losers of the war, which then created economic problems, and it was partly solved for five years, and the worldwide disaster in 29 came, so that many unemployed people, it felt unjust, it. they see how the others took things away, even as Hitler was in power, the Rhineland was full of French troops, so that it was a nationalist answer to that. That was the mistake of the f peace agreements, the forced peace agreements of the Second World War, uh, First World War. And here, all the countries, the Western countries, were nicer and more intelligent after the Second World War. They gave the countries, the losers, a chance. They gave Marshall Fund and not took money away. That worked out. It sees, shows also never punish a loser. He, that was one of the reasons. We had in Europe a situation over centuries that there was an unjust peace at the end of a war. And then the loser started a revenge, became stronger, and every 20 years, 30 years, you have a war, especially between the Germans and the French. This was one of these disasters. One war, one peace was the reason for the next war. And this rule and automatism was broken after 45, and especially through the European unification. The French wanted to control German steel after the World War and they occupied the Ruhr area, middle of the 20s, and so on. The idea of, uh, of the European community of cool and steel what it began with is the French made this time, exactly five years after the Second World War, a proposal. We would like again control German steel and coal because this was an important part for prepare for war. But we give the Germans the same right in France. And the Italians and Belgians joined it. The start was to control each other, but on the basis of non-discrimination. That was totally, that was the genial idea by Jean Monnet and Robert Schumann. 
which was taken by the Adenauers on board in days, in days. The Germany to Adenauers made this proposal on a Sunday, and on Tuesday agreed it and had a, uh, had a decision in the government. Nowadays you need uh, committees, uh, university papers, and after three years it's dead, the idea, because you had to make long discussions about it. We had an incredible luck to have leaders in these different European countries who understood it because of the disasters of the war. And, but, uh, and uh, that was the main difference. And that is the difference where we work on. But here we have one problem. We were so successful with that, that this is taken for granted. The younger generation do not, not, does not know it anymore. They said, oh, peace in Europe, that's automatic and forever that we have not to work for that. And here we have the, 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 this problem, problem of explanation where we started with today. And here we have to work or to make it clear that it's also in the future in our interest, because of other reasons. Our, but at the end, it's the same result. And the last question, please. What, what was your uh, motivation to become a politician many years ago? Personal it, question. Yeah. It was, no, I, I think it uh, was a coincidence. I well, had always interest in politics, and as a young, very young man, European uh, integration, but never thought about it to become a politician. And I worked a little bit in my local uh, little town in the youth organization of my party, as I was school and university, but never had that thought. But then, in my personal life came developments. I was studied first and then was a broadcaster. And I was press officer for the youth movement of my Christian Democratic Party, where we took part in the Communist Youth Festival in East Berlin in 73 and uh, where we had all the attacks, the Zelenische Komsomolsk and so on. And uh, these 10 days of fights in East Berlin where we distributed in East Berlin, which was a little bit dangerous, the United Nations uh, Charter of Fundamental Rights, on the uh, open places where there were 15 people in a world festival of four or 5,000 people. And then these 15 people said, you have to run for office. And they I became, within eight weeks, national vice chairman of the youth organization of the Adenauer and Kohl and Merkel party. It's a responsibility for European policy. That was not planned, but it happened. So you cannot decide, I want to become a politician. You will not a success. You are there in a certain moment where people believe you are the right person for that, or forget it. And therefore, but you have to be ready to take responsibility for your community and your country. That should be everyone. Take some time in your life, not as a profession, but to work for your town, to work for a charity organization. Take some responsibility for the community. Then you have to done your job, or it happens that such a coincident comes to take advantage or not advantage about it. I'm still not clear whether I made the right decision. I would have become a TV correspondent that offers for that, and I'm still not clear the decisions are 40 years old whether I made the right decision. Sometimes I believe I made a wrong decision, but uh, engage. You can only make service for your country and for yourself and your family if you engage for some time in your community. Do it in a democratic party and organization, but then does it, um, does it make a difference where, in which party? But it should be a democratic party. I must tell you that in this room, there are those who plan to be, to work in the journalism. But maybe they will end like you in the national parliament or in the European parliament. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome.
Okay, thank you very much. Um, and we are very grateful for your visit, for your lecture, and we hope it is not the last time that you visit Ukraine Catholic University. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you.